This is the M1 MacBook Air. It was released back in late 2020, and when it did, it made waves across the tech and creative landscapes for providing an incredible level of performance in a thin and light package. The advances made by Apple Silicon, paired with the optimization of both hardware and software, meant that this little laptop was able to perform in ways that were previously thought to be impossible with such a small footprint. Now, nearly three years later, the M1 MacBook Air still stands as an enticing entry point into the world of Apple laptops, especially for video shooters. But just what level of performance does it still provide, and more importantly, is it able to stand up to some of the strains and challenges that come along with day-to-day -day use as a video editing workstation? Well, that's what we're going to look at in today's video. We'll examine the M1 MacBook Air's capability, we'll see what kind of performance it has to offer, and whether or not it's still a good buy for someone who wants an entry-level laptop for editing videos. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. Now, as you're probably well aware by now, the MacBook Air is an incredibly thin and light laptop, with a thickness of 0.6 inches and weighing in at just 2.8 pounds. This makes it incredibly easy to carry around or to throw into a bag when you're editing on the go, which is something that I really like. Sometimes it's almost refreshing to not have to carry around a larger, heavier device in order to get things done. My 16-inch MacBook Pro, for example, while still a pretty sleek and light device relative to its size, adds on a noticeable amount of weight to my bag, whereas with the MacBook Air, you barely even know that it's there. While the small footprint of this laptop is definitely an advantage in some regards, it does come with its own set of trade-offs, namely a lack of ports. The MacBook Air comes equipped with just two Thunderbolt 4 ports and a 3.5mm headphone jack. That's it. Due to the slimness of the chassis and the tapered off ends, space for inputs and outputs is very limited. If you're just going to be using it to browse the web or as a school or work laptop, this isn't really a problem, but as a video editing machine, this could lead to some issues with connectivity. And when you need to work off the laptop while plugged in, the number of usable ports goes down from 2 to 1 since you're required to charge via one of the Thunderbolt ports. The lack of an SD card reader and HDMI port also means that you'll need to purchase some kind of adapter in order to actually import your footage or if you want to connect it to an external display. You'll very quickly find yourself in constant need of an adapter, which can get a little frustrating, especially when traveling. I will say that this issue isn't limited to just the MacBook Air. For years now, Apple has been criticized for being so reliant on adapters, and I do think that that criticism is earned. Only recently did the SD card reader and HDMI port make a return after five years of absence, and even then, they were limited to just the new Pro models only. I understand that the lack of ports is just the price you pay for such a thin design, but it is something to keep in mind if you'll be using this as your main machine. Once you open up the MacBook Air, you'll be greeted by the 13.3 inch Retina display, which looks amazing. Apple is known for pairing their computers with very nice displays, and that's most certainly true here. Colors are vivid and accurate, brightness is great, and icons, images, and text are all nice and sharp. This is definitely a display that you'll have no issues working off of as far as pure quality is concerned. One small thing that I will add though is that at times, I've found that the display can feel just a little bit cramped when working in busier applications like Premiere that rely on a lot of tabs and windows for any given workspace. It could be that I'm just not used to it, I typically work off of a much larger screen, but I thought that it might be worth noting here. Just below the display on both sides of the keyboard are the two built-in speakers. Now the speakers on this laptop sound pretty decent, they're nowhere near the level of a MacBook Pro, and generally I would classify their sound as being more on the flat side, but for light video editing or for projects that aren't very sound intensive, they should be just fine. If you are wanting to do some heavier mixing or audio editing, then it would definitely be worth your while to invest in a good pair of headphones or to edit off of a pair of studio monitors. Side note, if you're looking for a good pair of studio monitors, then once you're done with this video, be sure to check out the video that I did in collaboration with Vigilant Audio reviewing their Switch One studio monitors. They really are an impressive set of speakers that deliver amazing sound quality while also keeping a super low profile. But anyway, that's enough shameless plugging for one video, moving on. One other thing that I wanted to cover before we get into the actual editing performance is battery life. With it being a laptop, it's not crazy to assume that the MacBook Air is going to be spending a good amount of time relying on its internal battery. And especially if you're going to be doing a lot of editing on the go, it's important to know how long it can last between charges. 
Now on their website, Apple claims that the MacBook Air has 12 hours of battery life, which could be true for less intense use cases, albeit maybe only in the most optimal environment. But for video editing, you can just go ahead and throw that number straight in the trash because it's not going to be even close to that. When it comes to battery life, it's really difficult to give an exact number because it really does depend on your situation and what you'll be using it for, and there's a lot of variables involved. Things like brightness, speaker volume, what program you're using, what footage you're editing, and even the temperature of where you're using it at can play a role in how well your battery will perform. That being said, in my testing, I found that for video editing, specifically in Adobe Premiere, battery life hovers in the neighborhood of about four to six hours. Again, depending on your situation, you could see better or worse results, especially if you're not doing something as resource intensive as editing video. Four to six hours definitely isn't nothing. It's not gonna win any awards for outstanding battery life when editing, but I think for a lot of people, that should be more than enough to get by with. Though I think as a general rule, anytime you're gonna be taking this laptop with you on the go, you'll definitely want to make sure that you have a charger handy. Okay, so we've covered the design and features of this laptop plenty, but what really matters most here is performance. The M1 MacBook Air is fast, no doubt about it. The one I'm using is the base model, which ships with 8GB of RAM and 256GB of SSD storage, which makes startup and load times nice and quick, and overall, navigating around macOS feels very smooth and responsive. Of course, that's to be expected, since it's Apple's hyper-optimized proprietary OS running on Apple's hyper-optimized proprietary hardware. The real challenge comes when trying to edit video. And I gotta say, I'm genuinely surprised with how well it actually performed. For the majority of my testing, I used Adobe Premiere Pro to edit together a short sequence of clips with varying levels of effects and color correction applied to try and see how much I could push the system. Each of the clips were shot in 4K 10-bit 422 at 24fps using H.264 compression. I didn't use any proxy files, and to top it all off, all of the footage was shot in Vlog, meaning that I would have to apply a conversion LUT to each clip in order to bring it into the right color space. I did set the playback resolution to half, simply because when editing high resolution footage like 4K, you really don't need all those extra pixels, and honestly it's kind of a waste of system resources to have it rendering at full resolution. Needless to say though, this footage still isn't the easiest to work with, even with the lowered playback resolution. And also, given the fact that Premiere is notoriously unforgiving when it comes to lower-end hardware, and honestly even some higher-end hardware too, I was sure that the MacBook Air was going to struggle. But surprisingly, it managed to stand its ground pretty consistently. Even after I had added some color correction and stabilization to the clips, things continued to run pretty smoothly. Now that's not to say that it was a 100% flawless experience. There were moments where stuttering and slowdowns occurred, like when I animated a simple whip pan transition, but even then the MacBook Air bounced right back and any issues I experienced only hung around briefly before going back to running just fine. I decided to try and push the laptop a little harder and inserted a linked After Effects composition with some motion track text, and it seemed to struggle a little bit at first, but eventually evened out again and played just fine. Next, I added four color graded 4K clips into the timeline playing simultaneously, and while it did drop a handful of frames, playback was still generally very usable. After some time testing out Premiere, I then hopped over to DaVinci Resolve to see how things held up over there. Now, Resolve is a software that I don't have much experience with. I know that a lot of folks are switching over, and I've heard a lot of great things about it, especially how optimized it is and how well it performs when compared to Premiere. I attempted to edit together a timeline similar to the one that I had done in Premiere using all the same footage, and again, the results were very impressive. Where Premiere had experienced some mild slowdowns and stuttering, Resolve ran buttery smooth with no visible hiccups at all. Even when I placed four individually color corrected 4K clips into the timeline, the MacBook Air handled it without breaking a sweat. I'm still undecided whether or not this is more of a testament to Resolve's performance or the MacBook Air's, but either way, it's a shining example of what you can actually do with this laptop. So by now, I think that I can safely say the answer to the question, can it edit video, is yes, it absolutely can. And it can actually do so to an impressive degree. Through all my time testing this laptop, I continued to be pleasantly surprised with how well it handled the various situations I threw at it. It wasn't a flawless experience, don't get me wrong, and there were times where the limitations of the hardware were a little bit more noticeable. But at the end of the day, the fact that I was able to edit 10-bit 4K footage consistently, and for the most part smoothly, is still super impressive. And the fact of the matter is, the person who's looking into this laptop as their main editing machine probably isn't going to be editing such demanding footage anyway. This kind of brings me into the final point of this video, and that's who is this laptop for, and if you're thinking about picking it up, is it still worth your time, and more importantly, your money? So first off, who is this laptop actually for? 
I think that the M1 MacBook Air is ideal for content creators, filmmakers, or photographers who are either just starting out and are interested in giving the Mac environment a try, or who just need a capable machine to work and learn off of without having to pay the pro price tag. I think back to when I was first getting into videography and learning how to edit more seriously. Had this laptop been around at that time, I would have probably picked it up in a heartbeat. I also wouldn't go as far as to limit this laptop only to beginners. Maybe you're somebody who doesn't exactly need to be able to edit 10-bit footage, and instead, you just need a reliable computer to edit some less complex projects off of. The M1 MacBook Air would be an excellent choice for you. Okay, finally, is this laptop worth picking up in 2023, specifically for video editing? The short answer is yes, however, with a small caveat. While I think that the base model is still very capable and very impressive, for video editing, I would highly recommend spending out the extra money and upgrading the RAM from 8 to 16 gigabytes. This is going to help you out a ton in the long run, and it's especially going to help you out should you need to edit some more demanding footage, if you're going to be dealing with larger projects, or if you need to do any kind of regular multitasking between applications. And realistically, if you plan on editing video at all in 2023, you really should have 16 gigabytes as a minimum, especially since most video editors nowadays recommend that you have at the very least 16 gigabytes of memory. Other than that, I think that the M1 MacBook Air is still a fantastic buy in 2023. Not only do you get the incredible performance of the M1 chip, but you also get an excellent display and all the great features and optimization of macOS, all in a super thin and light package. That small design and the fact that this is an entry-level machine means that there are a few trade-offs, namely a lack of ports and some fairly average battery life when editing, but ultimately I think that those are offset by the incredible value that you get for the money. It would certainly be worth your while to pay the extra money to get the model with more memory, but even then, if you should opt to go for the base model, you can be sure that you're still getting a ton of bang for your buck, and for basic or even some more moderate sized projects, it should hold up just fine. So whether you're a beginner looking for your first editing machine, or somebody who's a little bit more experienced, who just doesn't need all the extra power and cost that comes with a pro machine, the M1 MacBook Air is an excellent choice that brings a great balance of performance and price, and is one that you should definitely keep on your radar. Well, that just about wraps things up for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, I'd encourage you to please leave a like down below. And if you want to see more film and tech related videos just like this one, then consider subscribing to the channel and turning on notifications so you never miss out on new content. If you've got any thoughts, feedback, suggestions, or you just want to say hi, then leave a comment down below. I really do enjoy reading what you guys have to say, and I try to respond to as many as I can. So with all of that being said, you've been watching All Around Filmmaker, and I'll see you in the next video.